what are the different kinds of thunderstorms we can get, that's what we're going to talk about today. I get my best idea in thunderstorms. I have the power and the majesty of nature on my side. Rouse Dedman. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about thunderstorms. We learned the basics. You need the warm, moist air. You need it going upwards. I didn't mention it last time, but it rises in a column. If you try putting hot water with dye in it in a cold tub, the water comes up in a column. That's how it happens inside the storm, too. Put a link in the show notes to a video of that as well. But as long as the warm air stays at the ground, nothing happens. It's fine. And if the cold air sits up in the top, that's fine, too. But as soon as that warm air starts to rise, the cloud starts to condense, the upper level winds start to tilt the form, get that cauliflower shape, maybe get an anvil, the downdraft forms from the rain, and it starts to get stronger and stronger. That's when we get those big storms. And some of them can certainly get more dangerous. But let's talk about the different kinds of storms we can get. The first one is simple. It is a single cell thunderstorms. I tend to think of those as more of the summertime thunderstorms, where it's just a single cell. You see it on a radar. It's just going in this one direction. I saw one that was probably about 20 miles from my house a couple of years ago. I could see its entire structure on the horizon. There were a few straddling clouds around the area, but nothing big, no big complexes. These spring storms, in my mind, are the ones that form lines, big complexes. The summer storms just get the right conditions in a local area, and it just forms up. And then after like an hour, it dies away. It can make hail, and it can have heavy rain, and it can even produce a tornado. But more rarely, when it's over with, it's over with. It's just that single blob we see on the radar. But then you can get something that is called a multi-cell cluster of storms. And that's where there's going to be a bunch of storms. Again, I think of those as in spring. They can happen summer or fall or winter as well. But it takes a lot more energy to get them going. And that spring clash of air, the warm, moist air, the cold upper air comes together and can produce a whole line of storms. They can ramp up and be even a little bit stronger. They fall in front of what is called a low pressure system. So you see them as being a much bigger event. These thunderstorm cell complexes can form what is called a mesoscale convective complex. The meso means 100. It can be 100 miles across, but essentially this large system, and it follows along. These storms, because they have so much energy in them, can create squall lines, big complex, tall storms, and are much more sophisticated in their structure. You might even see a wall cloud, which is where the cloud starts to descend from the cloud itself. Sometimes tornadoes can form in them. Sorry, I don't mean to be scary. Even at times, the squall line, which is a line of thunderstorms, can start forming in this bow pattern. When you see that bow pattern, that's an indication that it is forming a large wind in front of it. So you will start feeling very high winds in front of the storm before the storm even gets your way. But that storm complex is working together to produce that bow echo or the bowing of the storm system that you would see on a radar. And the storms will generally then form from a general cumulus cloud, those large puffy clouds, to the cumulus nimbus clouds, this long stretch of big, dark, fluffy clouds, maybe as far as the eye can see. So it can get quite organized. Then you can even get something that is called a supercell. The supercells are what the storm chasers are really going after. They are a self-contained cell. It is rotating inside itself. So the updraft and the downdraft get twisted up together, and now it's generating its own energy. It is marching across the land and causing severe thunderstorms as it goes. Because the cloud itself rotates, it can also produce tornadoes. It has that convection inside of it. And someone says, if you see a rotating storm cell like this, run, take cover, go inside. Your best protection is always going to be inside 
in the lowest level of your house, hopefully a basement, and surrounded by pipes. Those pipe structures in your basement will protect you more than anything. Usually what happens when people get injured during a severe thunderstorm is they get hit by something. So anything that you can do by going into the lower level and having those pipes, it can keep you from getting struck by anything in high speed. And what happens, it can get hail. The taller the cloud structure is, the more the hail can bump around inside of there. And as it bumbles around inside the storm, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it's getting pushed up. It needs a lot of height to the storm to get pushed way up there and form big size hail. That's when they know that if it is going to hail, the hail is going to be rather large. And these supercells are perfect for those kinds of occurrences. They say there's something called a flanking line, and those flanking lines are the trailing clouds of clouds after the thunderstorm itself. So the general structure is the front part. We have the anvil with the finger pointing in the direction it's going. In the center part, we may have the center of the storm. We'll see the rain coming down or the hail coming down. We'll also have the updraft going into the storm itself. If there is a wall cloud that's a descended part of the cloud itself, that is going to be, again, more in towards the center. And then behind it is the flanking line, which is the backside of the cloud. A tornado usually forms, not always, in behind the wall cloud towards the back side of the cloud. And some of these are what we call mesoscale convective systems, can last for more than 12 hours. These are going to be the storms that march into the night. They can have a broken line or a solid line or can form along in a cluster. This is called a mesoscale convective complex, MCC, and it has a long life. It's possible then it will die out at the nighttime. We talked a little bit about what diurnal storms are or the storms that last through the night that have a lot of energy going. And then in the early morning, when warming comes back up, it can form that whole complex again because the recipe is still there unless there is some other system that broke it up. And a convective storm can cover almost an entire state. These are huge systems and they're pulling moisture from a big area. The bigger the storm gets, the more it's pulling in and more it has energy. There's another storm type that's called a day retro. People say it a little bit differently. That's how I've always said it, but it's straight line winds. So tornadoes get that circular rotation and their winds go in a circular rotation. But these instead are straight winds that can go up to 240, up to even 290 miles per hour in a straight direction. They usually have a certain width to them and they last for a certain period of time. And you can see them from satellite pictures or airplane photographs because they'll have a line where a bunch of trees are down in a row. And that's what hit some of what was Iowa. They had those 290 mile per hour winds. And a part of what happened in my city, we have a ton of trees down, but not quite in a straight line. So it didn't quite form the derecho, but instead it is enough of a straight line wind that it did cause a lot of damage anyway. I know this whole podcast just turned scary, but just so you know what can be expected out of this. But we do have warning systems in place. In the United States, we have the National Weather Service, and they have a bunch of computer power to get some predictions out there. There's radar, there's satellites. We'll talk a little bit about both of them. And there's even European storm prediction centers, too. And Europe has, likewise, the Meteo Alarm, an early storm warning system for Europe. There's other places and other storm types of systems. Every government agency has some sort of a storm warning system. And there's different models out there. They basically take an idea, a concept of how they can predict a storm. There's a few North American models out there. There's a European storm model that's very good. In fact, I think a lot of people consider it to be among the best in the world. And what they do is they take a look at the different models. Why do we get different results from different models from different places in the world? From my understanding of it, the European model does more weight on what happened in the past. When we had a storm located in this particular area with low pressure in these particular places, this was the temperature, 
This was the this was the high temperature. This was the low temperature. This is typically what happened. Europe takes more of that historical view of what happens with storms. The United States model is a little bit different. It used to be quite bad, honestly, and it got a little bit better and actually pretty darn good in the last few years as they revised their models. They just were very inaccurate. I know personally, I always looked at the European models for the best information. But we take those models and now we have a chance because of the internet to look at all of them. What I do personally is I look at them and see the idea of where it's at. A good number of the models predict we're going to get six inches of snow or we're going to get severe weather. This one says it's going to be very minimal, but this other model says it's going to be quite severe. So I get a range or an idea of what I can expect to happen. And then I can plan accordingly. If it's going to be severe, I'm close to some place that I can go inside. And I don't walk around outside with large sticks like golfing or go hiking on that day. I'm always close to shelter. But those models help all the weather forecasters try to get an understanding of what is going to happen. And then they can prepare. I fundamentally believe that with AI and our better computer resources, these models are just going to get better and better and better. We're going to be able to see patterns in it. Right now, we know that when a low pressure is here and a high pressure is there, I don't know, I think that's what's going to happen. AI is going to do a better job of trying to figure out what's going to happen next. And the weather services have something that's called radar or Doppler radar. It used to be for a long t- period of time, the radar systems we had in place were what we had from World War II. A lot of modernization with the Doppler and other types of radars have made weather forecasting so much better. And they can take a look to see. This Doppler radar sends out an electromagnetic wave and it bounces back. It it tells us how heavy the rain is, how thick it is, and maybe if there's hail in it, it can be then tilted up into various degrees. And based on that tilt, we can tell how high that storm is. Again, if it's just a storm that's sitting there at 20,000 feet, it's not going to do much. But it gets up to 60,000 feet or 70,000 feet. Watch out. So with these radar tilts, we'll know how tall these systems are. They can even see things that are very hard to see. For instance, there's something called a debris ball. What will happen is if a storm has become tornadic, it starts pulling material from earth, trees and other things, up into the storm system, up 50, 60,000 feet, and creates a ball of stuff that was previously on the earth. You can actually see that on radar. They know how far up it's going and how far out it's going because eventually it's going to dump that stuff out. The radars now are so sophisticated. And then there's even satellites. The satellites are also now very sophisticated. We can see various levels. We can see where the cloud systems are moving. We can see when they're building up or they're shrinking down. We want to know with as much information as possible What is the current nature of the storm? There's some very good even radar applications you can get on your phone. One of them that I use is called Radar Scope. You can use that to see how severe your storm is starting to look, even from your own home. You have to know how to use it. It's a little bit more difficult to see rotation in a storm. A storm relative velocity. Why that's important is that you can get two different color coatings with this particular kind of radar. You get one color, usually red, when the storm is moving away from the radar. And then you get a green, this is how they just code it in the computer data, as it's coming towards you. Fine. You can expect that a storm typically goes from west to east, and you can tell when it crosses over the threshold of the radar. It goes from green to red. It's moving away. But once you see green and red rotating or inside of a storm where you would not expect it, now you know part of that little cell is moving away from the radar. Part of it is moving towards. It's a good sign that there's rotation in that storm system. So when you get good at looking at that kind of thing, you can see, ooh, that looks like there's some rotation forming in there. 
And that's when I personally decided to go into the basement. When I started seeing that green red mix, I headed for the basement, then the sirens blew. It's kind of a fun skill to learn how to use the various radars that the government and others provide and how to read the additional information like the storm relative velocity. It's true, too, that other types of storms will make good use of satellite systems. We can see hurricanes and other types of weather issues from these satellites. Our technology, like I said, is just so much better than it used to be that we can do so much more. One thing to keep in mind about radar is that radar is very pixelated. You can see the little blocks, it looks like Minecraft, of the individual cell storms. Whenever you see these smooth, very blobby storm radars, it's the computer that's doing that for you. So it's creating a nice smooth blob of these storms as compared to the pixelated. The pixelated is actually more accurate, but the Smooth radars that you see in most applications, those are the ones that are a little bit easier to read. You can see how the red is forming and dissipating, meaning it's getting stronger and then going away. Light plays an interesting thing when it comes to a storm. The sky color can become weird and kind of blue-green creepy, but it's not the tornadoes that people think produce that blue-green color. Think of color that you see is the fact that color gets absorbed. So when we see a blue sky, it's the red, yellow wavelengths, orange, that are getting absorbed by our atmosphere. And blue is the only thing that passes through. It can happen because the sun is on the low horizon. There's a sunset behind the storm. And as the light passes through the storm, some of the colors get absorbed and some of them get scattered. And it makes it appear what we see. When you see a sunset going through and there's not much water in there, the storm itself can kind of have a red hue to it. But when there's a lot of rain, the blue water is absorbing that red color and what we see out of it is more of the blue-green color. So you're not seeing a tornado when you see that blue-green color. What you're seeing is there's a lot of water droplets in that storm and that causes the green tint. It can be correlated or related to each other, but it's not that a green sky is caused by tornadoes or the possibility for tornadoes. Someday we'll do a whole thing on color and what color you see. There's also a couple of other systems out there to help us stay safe when we have severe weather. One of them is called Skywarn. It is a citizen training system so that we can train people to spot storms. Meteorologists, Also, safety, police, fire, and regular people like us. I've taken the Skywarn system training before, but it helps people identify severe weather, what a tornado actually is going to look like. Sometimes when you have a very energetic downdraft, it can drag pieces of the cloud down from the storm itself. That's not a tornado. There's no rotation there. It is just kind of hoofing out a little bit of the cloud. What the Skywarn system will train you is to see rotation, to understand the structure of a cloud so you know where to look and what is actually rotation that could lead to a tornado. When you have a trained storm spotter, then you know they know what they're talking about a little bit more than the general public. It also, like I said, is good because you get a lot of the public safety people inside your city, the police and fire, to understand what a storm looks like so they can be better at saying what they see. But this training, if you're in the United States, is all over the place. It's free and it's fascinating to see what these weather systems look like. Then there are three kinds of messages that we get from the government, at least in the United States. One of them is an advisory or sometimes they'll either issue a weather statement you know what, the conditions are looking quite possibly like they could turn severe. Just keep an eye out. Tomorrow, maybe tomorrow is going to be a little dicey when it comes to weather. Then when there's a watch, watch means the conditions are correct. It's a little bit closer to the event itself. And it says, hey, watch out, Chicago. Your system that is to the west of you is in that correct structure that could produce severe weather. And then a warning means something is actually happening right now. A severe thunderstorm, a blizzard, a tornado. That means that when you see the warning, it's 
meant for you to act. Take cover. Do the thing now. Get inside. It is important to know that when warnings are issued, something is actually going on. And that's if it's a tornado is when the tornado sirens are going to blow. For me, when we had our storms, the sirens blew. And I think blew for a longer period of time. That's when me, the bird, my computer, everything went in the basement. We sat down there editing podcasts. But it can give you a chance to get inside, get someplace safe. So my challenge to you is look out for any watches, warnings, or advisories that you have in your own system. What actually happened out of them? If you heard that there was going to be a thunderstorm watch, did you get a thunderstorm? Did it get severe? What did you see on the radar? There's a lot of great radar apps out there. Apple has one. There's one called Carrot. But try to notice this summer when you have a watch or warning, take a look at the radar and see what you see. It'll help you learn whether or not you're having a single cell storm, a mesoscale storm, or maybe one of those supercells that the storm chasers all go running for. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe. And tell a friend if you think there are other people who are out there interested in these kinds of topics. We're going to talk about so many things from astronomy to rocks, birds, animals, you name it. If it's something sciencey that we can just observe, we're going to talk about it without getting into science too deeply. And remember, get it out there, except during a thunderstorm. Just stay in then. <laughs>